Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome to our lecture course on understanding contemporary art. Right now we're in the middle of a discussion of the works of Yanis Kounelis, who is one of the artists of the Arte Povera, or Povera movement, um, that came out of <clears throat> Italy in the 1960s. And last time we saw how, when we glanced at some of the other artists, uh, like Pino Pascali, we saw his use there of water and Giuseppe Pannoni's use of wood um, and, and stone and uh, Mario Mertz's use of, of stone. We saw the elemental emphasis on these Arte Povera artists. Um, and it means, Povera means poor, so it's a poor art because they're using found objects. They're using poor things, uh, the things of the poor of, of daily life. Um, and we didn't, one of the elements that we didn't address there was fire. We saw how Alberto Buri, uh, in the previous video, used uh, blow torches in his work, in his Plasticcia Combustione works. Um, and now what we want to do is look at the principle of luminosity in Yanis Kunelis' works, which is, of course, uh, the principle of fire. He's been using blow torches all through his work. Um, now, if we look back at this, this is an early work of his. This is Fires from uh, 1971. And we can see that he's put <clears throat> a series of blow torches down across the floor. They look rather serpentine um, in their nature, and uh, it makes one think they have little, almost like little tongues of flame coming out of them. And it reminds one of the myth of uh, the Christian myth of Pentecost, in which the Holy Spirit descends with tongues of flame to each of the disciples, uh, conferring on each disciple a different language, so that the, that particular disciple can then go out and disseminate the Logos, the word uh, of Christianity. And indeed, uh, the blowtorch as it is used by Cornelis, according to Cornelis, is a symbol in his work for the Holy Spirit. Um, so this is the use of fire in his cosmos of heaviness and weight and falling bodies and gravitas. This is the principle of luminosity uh, that in his cosmology is the principle of transformation. The blowtorch uh, is the fire of the spirit that is always transforming, that always transforms one thing into another in his cosmos. Here's a much later work of his. This is Cornelis. Uh, this is untitled in 1987-88. Here we've got a series of blow torches, um, propane torches, uh, moving from left to right, uh, the direction in the west that we read. And it's surrounded by a series of uh, what look like to be old-fashioned singer sewing machines that, that, connect, that, that suggest or connote the epoch of industrial mass production. We can envision uh, a, a room of tables filled with these sewing machines with women sitting at them, perhaps working at a factory, a, a seamstress factory, sewing, making garments. And then here comes uh, the principle of transformation of the Holy Spirit that moves in to transform this world. On the one hand, it's the industrial world that is being transformed, that is falling away, that's burned away. But on the other hand, there's also an ancient myth that um, just as the seamstress makes the garment uh, for the body to inhabit, so too the body, and this is especially true in, in Indian, uh, some of the Hindu traditions, the body is the clothing for the soul. So the soul is that which is incarnate in the body, and the soul puts on and puts off bodies the same way we put on clothing and put them off again. So there's that, and the fires of the Holy Spirit are always transforming the soul. Eventually, the fires of the Spirit burn the body away. We're always being transformed as we move through the various thresholds of life. Uh, we move from becoming an embryo to becoming a, a human that's out in the world, uh, to becoming a, a child, to becoming a man or a woman, to becoming an old man or an old woman, and eventually becoming a discarnate soul once again. And the cycle continues. So the fires, the purgatorial fires of transformation are always being uh, applied to us. We're always in the flame and we're always undergoing one or another ordeal. We're like insects that go through these life cycles of transformation. We enter into the, the, sh the shell like a cicada does and we transform or, or the caterpillar and we transform and then move on to the next phase of transformation. So for Canellus, there's always fire there that is the principle in his cosmos of materiality and falling bodies of transformation and change. Um, this is one of his most famous works here. This is the untitled 1984-1987. Uh, it's a very long horizontal work. You can see it, the whole work here from afar as it moves uh, also from left to right, the direction in the west that we read. If we look at it, uh, the first half of it in close-up, we can see once again, <clears throat> he's got the bed frame there in the corner with the blowtorch, the blowtorch symbolizing uh, the fires of transformation that, that burn us through all the various stages and phases of life. And then he's got blankets in the middle here. Each shelf has a different blanket. 
Blankets suggest warmth, and they suggest something domestic, something useful, and the bits of wood uh, that might be used for a fire, or they might be used to construct a house. All the associations are domestic. Uh, we're born, at least in the old world, we're born on beds, and I suppose, too, still in hospital rooms where children are born from mothers lying in bed in one way or another. So there's the connotation of birth and the connotation of uh, being in a world that is at a human scale. Uh, if we look at the second half of it, in the middle, there's a, uh, there's a blank canvas that's an allusion to Malevich's black square, which in Kunelis, though, I think has different connotations. It's a semiotically indeterminate uh, square that suggests that the possibility for the human mind to project new systems of meaning. This is part of the life cycle, too. You're always living in a culture with semiotically determinate, determinate signifiers that are imprinting on you all the time some worldview. You're always in a world that's worlding in the Heideggerian sense, that's resonating with significance. And Kunilis has said that the latter half of this composition, we have a series of semiotic vacancies here where there used to be oil lamps and they have left their scars. Uh, Kunilis has said that this referred to oil lamps uh, at a cemetery in Athens where he was growing up, where they used to carry the flames out to the, to the graves. And so <clears throat> on the one hand, we've got the idea that it refers to death. The other half of the canvas referred to birth. This refers to death, but it also, from my way of thinking, also indicates a series of semiotic vacancies where there once used to be uh, semiotic significances that have now been deconstructed. We're at the end of a world age here, after all, in which all the transcendental signifieds have crumbled and fallen apart. We've seen Gerhard Richter uh, creating in his abstract painting scars of being. Here, too, we have also scars of being where a world has vanished. Something active, uh, a world of meaning and significance was once here. Uh, in Cornelis's world, but now he's left behind the scars and the ghosts of a world that has vanished. And so there is the suggestion here that there's a world waiting to be filled in now. We're in between world horizons. We're in the middle of what the Hindus call a pralaya, in between world horizons. Uh, remember this when we look at the work of Christian Boltansky. He does some interesting things with, with flame also in semiotic vacancies. Uh, and I think there might be some influence of Cornelis on Boltansky. And then if we look at this exhibition, uh, that is recent. This was held at uh, Westminster at the Ambika P3 exhibition of Kunelis's work in 2010. And here we have a um, sort of monumentalization and apotheosis of his earlier works. This is a giant K, of course, standing for Kunelis, but it also stands for Kafka and for K, Kafka's protagonist. Um, and this is K's world. This is the factory world. There are 11 coal bins here, all sitting up on bleachers. And the coal always signifies uh, the industrial capitalist imaginary, uh, the world of factories and mass production. And so here we can see that what is being mass produced here in this factory world are these glass bottles that, on the one hand, allude to Warhol's world of glass bottles, seriality, mass reproduction. But on the other, he's drawn a, a black muslin cloth across them uh, as a way of effacing and erasing them. And here again, we can see a series of black muslin cloths that he's put around them because for Cornelis, uh, the work of art is a singularity. It, the, it, it's an absolutely unprecedented singularity that completely ruptures the kinds of mass production that produce the capitalist imaginary, which is a realm of mere objects disconnected from being in the Heideggerian sense. They have no more significance other than what the, their use value, their use function is. And uh, for Canellis, he's essentially like Richter was doing, he's, he's crossing that world out, Warhol's world of seriality and repetition, the capitalist, the late capitalist, hyper-capitalist imaginary of seriality and repetition, which diminishes things, everything that it reproduces, simply because it produces too many of them. But the work of art is a total singularity for Cornelis. And here at the same exhibition, we've got a little alcove where he's put the, the coats of the workers that might be hanging up their coats as they check in to the factory for work. But there's a sense of ghostliness where I think these coats stand in for the workers themselves. They're, they're hollow individuals. They've been hollowed out by enslavement to the capitalist mega machine, which has essentially turned them into hollow men. And their scale has been diminished. Uh, we have an allusion here to uh, his earlier work, The Civil Tragedy of 1975, with the, the Viennese coat rack and the hat that suggests the sort of remains of a human, like a cicada's shell on a tree that's been left behind by the absence of that insect. That's what we have here. This is a world of diminished human beings. Kafka's world uh, is the world of the diminished human being who's been ontologically dwarfed, scaled down to the level of an insect by the gigantism now, 
not of great humans, but of machines. The machines are the gigantic element, and those have diminished the significance of the human lifetime to non-importance. And I think that's what's going on here with Cunellus. And I think um, if we, Cunellus essentially, if we look at some of his other works here, we've got these bells on a, a table suggesting a quiet bells ringing in the sleepy mid-afternoon with people taking naps in peasant villages. Uh, here we've got bags of burlap that might be used to transport lentils or coffee beans or what have you. Um, the materials here in this last one for making a fire, that the world of stone uh, and fires and contact with the earth and elements. It's all very elemental. It's all very place specific. Cunellus in his works is essentially trying to reconstruct the world of what Fernand Braudel called memory and the Mediterranean. This is a, a world that mattered, in which the human being mattered, and in which life was scaled down to human use. Uh, humans were not uh, subject to gigantic machines that dwarfed them into insignificance. This was a world, to use Heidegger's terminology yet again, in which things thinged and worlds worlded. And that simply means that for Heidegger, when a thing things, it sends out significance that connects together the world of earth and sky, mortals and divinities. They're brought together in a fourfold that is knit together to create a world that worlds, which is to say a specific locality that sends out resonance, waves of resonance that have meaning for the people living in that locality. That's precisely, of course, the world that is ruptured uh, as objects are torn from being and things can no longer thing anymore. Worlds can no longer resonate in the world of GPS maps and uh, late capitalism, hypercapitalism, global free trade agreements, uh, the world of the IMF and the World Bank, the, the whole world of globalization ruptures and destroys all of that. And I think Kunellis is a kind of Heideggerian artist in many respects who's trying to bring the significance of things back in, the, the, the earth and, and its relationship to uh, objects that stand in between the horizon of earth and world. And uh, that's Yanis Kunellis.